<laughs> We're on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is uh, a, another hour where I can, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a full hour, but it's another uh, uh, opportunity for me to talk about uh, uh, banjo related topics. And uh, this, uh, uh, this week is going to be uh, speed. You know the, the the technique of of how to play maybe fast if you like that and um, uh, ornamentation um, and and why are they there and how we could use them. So uh, I'm going to start off with the, the question of um, speed. You know I think uh, it interests a lot of people who have been playing for a, also a number of years. You know how they could maybe increase the speed or um, and before I start, you know, talking about my my personal take on these on these things and don't forget <laughs> i always put the disclaimer in front these are my personal takes i uh, started playing banjo a long time ago um, even though i don't look that old <laughs> I, i've been playing pretty much every day for the last uh, well well over 40 years you know and um, so i um, well almost 50 uh, that is so no excuses so first of all uh, fast I, I think uh, just to dig in a little bit of the of the history of fast um, music uh, wasn't uh, supposed to be played fast you know a long time ago it was uh, I'm talking about a few hundred years ago it was about uh, the composition about the intellectual um, content of the art of the craft of the of the of the composition and of course you know the emotions that it would uh, uh, you know um, uh, as a result, you know, evoke in people's minds, and uh, fast came came later. There was a time in the Baroque music, of course, where uh, we had thrills and all kinds of, you know, fast, you know, effectful things. But it wasn't actually playing fast per se. You know, maybe there were uh, things I'm going to talk about afterwards. Where they're part of the melody and they're they're fast, but they're not per se just really fast as as a, as a piece. Um, it was always about the composition and if the composition required something fast well then there was a little fast passage of it but the music was in general not in a very very fast pace actually a lot of times it was a lot slower than even classical music today is performed of the composers and there's a big dispute you know in uh, uh, in uh, in scholars of classical music what was the original tempi of of uh, beethoven or mozart and how how fast was it actually played well but with banjo, we pretty much know it because we have the recordings of Earl Scruggs and we have the recordings of Don Reno. We know how these, how, how fast these, these, uh, these pieces were. Um, but then when we look back, you know, uh, uh, on the time, there was a very important point in in music. Uh, there was a, a Paganini. A Paganini was a man who played violin. And uh, he was considered to be almost a freak-like nature who could play so fast and he would play common uh, concertos that everybody would know and he would play them in half the time. And people would be, uh, would be amazed. And then, he, of course, he composed a lot of pieces that were, you know, so to say, they were devilish hard to play. And uh, even, even the greatest violinists of today, you know, struggled to get through the repertoire of Paganini. And, it's, uh, uh, and Paganini lived... Uh, uh, he died in, eight, in uh, 1840. He was uh, born in 17. What is it? Uh, I've written it down. 1782. Um, but he was a. He became a star as a performer. Now you have to see that there were no stars as performers. It was not looked at something at the time that was desirable for a artist to be admired as artist. It was about the music and about you know honoring God or the emperor or. Uh, or the piece, or the story, or you know all these things, but that an artist uh, goes on stage and you know puts himself in the limelight and actually presents something that is astonishing, like a circus act, like a flame for a flame swallower or something like that. Th that was not in music. <laughs> Maybe that was done in some in some genres, but not not in the broad field of music. And in uh, uh, Beethoven, uh, you know, took a liking of that idea of virtuosity and he would play you know amazing piano things and he would put put himself in the in the in the center stage performing unbelievably difficult things he would sometimes even use uh, a passage where he could play with you know you would actually play on the piano with two hands he would just play with one hand just to show that he could do it 
or you would write it in, you know, just so it was. It was a show. It was a show of of his ability. And people, some people didn't like that because they thought, well, he's displaying himself. He's putting himself above the music because music is something very sacred. So you shouldn't put yourself above the music. That was the sentiment of the time. I'm just trying to uh, sort of uh, put that there. Now, a virtuosity is always then became really took a hold of classical music in the late romantic in particular and it became uh, so strongly virtuoso uh, music that you couldn't even play a line anymore that would be you know because it would be almost too simple you know you would try to 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 make something very extraordinary and very difficult out of it um, and so composers who maybe would write a violin concerto uh, they they needed, you know, the best violin players in the world to also put the most technical skills in there. Uh, unlike the early Beethoven, you know, the the the, 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 the uh, violin concerto, you know, that Beethoven wrote, uh, very simple melodies in a sense, you know, very beautiful, uh, profound melodies um, that were in the tradition of just honoring the music and the emotions that it awakes through the music, not from the speed aspect. And maybe you're wondering why am I going on uh, on this so much. But it has a lot to do with uh, uh, with the music, with with the, because there's a lot of people out there who can't play fast and maybe never even will be playing fast and uh, maybe don't even want to play fast and I think that's perfectly fine. I, I, if, that there's not a, there's not a must and I don't want to make the impression that there's a necessity of playing fast. Uh, there's a necessity of playing with the heart, uh, absolutely, but not necessarily in the display of artistic you know, uh, uh, madness, <laughs> so, to, so to say. So <laughs> just say, just, just to sort of give that as a, as a preface, you know, to, to this. Um, now in bluegrass banjo, of course, we expect a certain speed. But when I, when I go up to the dance barn here at Laurel Springs, you know, where I would go, you know, uh, and play, there's a, there's a, there's a, that's about the speed everybody plays, you know. Uh, so, uh, It wouldn't be faster than that all night long, pretty much, you know, in the barn dance. Maybe sometimes a little bit faster, but not much because people need to dance to it. And uh, uh, tunes that couldn't be danced to anymore, you know, were referred as breakdowns, things, you know, that, that you could not uh, uh, use other than just to be excited about how virtuoso these people are playing, you know. Uh, so bluegrass music always had a little part where... Uh, this virtuosity of fastness would, would take place, you know, in a few tunes, a few singing songs, uh, Pig in the Pen, uh, you know, um, Rolling My Sweet Baby's Arms, of course, you know, the fiddle tunes like Fire on the Mountain and, um, uh, uh, of course, you know, the breakdowns. And how do we get to playing faster uh, when we already play a piece? Let's say we have a piece, um, let's uh, see... Now, how do we speed this up, uh, or how would we even get to the speed? <laughs> this is this is the question, and this is this is the things I want to talk about. Now, when you first learn the piece, it is important that you don't want to play it fast, I think. It is it is important that you just learn the notes where they are. And in order to do that, when you, in the same time, try to play fast, it is hard. You, you're putting a lot of stress on yourself, you know, uh, trying to remember the notes and playing them fast at the same time. So it's sometimes much better if you would maybe see, okay, this is how theme time starts. <laughs> Then once you can play that really, really well, uh, you can start speeding it up. And here is, there's two different schools, you know, of how this could be done. <laughs> okay, so uh, for one, there's a school of the metronome, which is the school of Paganini. You know, after Paganini, with the metronome, Melzel metronome, there were virtuoso schools that opened up in Poland. 
around 1850, 1860. And they were trying really hard to train kids to play enormously fast because it was, you know, fashion of the time that you could display an amazing amount of skill uh, as a musician uh, playing really, really fast. So they would slowly and sure, but surely, you know, just increase the speed of the metronome and try to play uh, with it and play. And that that's a method that really works, that works actually quite well, I would say. On the other hand, there's also a, a very natural way of, of how it will happen. If you want to play faster, okay, that's, a, that's very important now. <laughs> because when children learn to run, I mean, they walk and then they fall, of course, but then they want to run. And so when they start running, they're going to fall. That's just what it is. You know, they're just, they're just going to fall. That's why as a parent, you're always happy when they run over meadows instead of parking lots. So, uh, so you can see, you can see they, they have to control their, their feet and they have to control their motion. They get out of breath and then th maybe the steps become a little shorter. They start to stumble, you know, things like that. And they have to overcome all these problems that you would have not overcome if you wouldn't never try to actually run fast. We all know these things, but it's the same with the banjo playing. If I don't allow myself to play mistakes, I don't learn actually where I have trouble. So, so if I go to the point where I definitely start making mistakes, that's a good thing in that, in that method. Right, so not the metronome method, where in the where they would you know with a whip you know hit the hit hit the kid over a head, you know with a stick you know if it makes a mistake you know and and that's very cruel. It works, but it's it's very very cruel and not a lot of fun. And it can actually beat the fun out of music you know uh, for anyone. And you can do that to yourself. You can actually beat yourself the fun out of music, the love to music. You can make yourself not like music as much anymore if you do it the wrong way. Um, uh, the, the, let's say the wrong way is not the right way for you, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, but if you take a piece and then start to, to speed, let's say Cumberland Gap. So you're quite happy with this now, but you want to have it faster, so you're going to go. And as soon as you start spinning, as you start to feel the edges of where you have trouble, where your fingers start to 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 not want to do that anymore, uh, that doesn't need to be that fast right now. <laughs> it can be much slower, but the effect is the same. You start to realize, oh, here's a problem. And then you plow through it. You do it again. And because Cumberland Gap is such a short little piece, you can play the same passage again and again, and then go to that same phase again and work your, work your way in. Uh, that's that. You can do that with any piece. We used to uh, play every piece that we knew, Blackberry Blossom or... Uh, try to play it as fast as possible uh, just to find where we would stumble uh, just to find these these and get and work through them because you don't find them when you play in a comfort zone see you don't and um, for me it was uh, a, a, a life saving thing you know I mean I needed to attract people while they were walking by while I was playing on the street as a teenager and this was my livelihood i was living on the streets with my brother and we were playing on street corners and people would walk by now if you play i don't think anybody will stop really you know but if you play so you really want to play and project energy out to the people in order so they turn their heads and say oh there's somebody doing something and maybe i like it or i just appreciate the effort and i'm gonna give them something <laughs> so so and then when we, we are already we also realized you know that there were pieces that were not so hard to play but they sounded amazing like 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 john hickman's <laughs> I 
that sounds co more complicated than it actually is. But uh, for people, this was a it was a show. It was a stopper. You know, it would stop them in their tracks because to play this on a piano is a lot harder than to play this on a banjo uh, or to play it on any other instrument, pretty much. You know, so there's things that on a banjo sound very effectful because you can play them very fast. And when I would play down on the streets in Europe, you know, and and use these things that I could play fast on the banjo, um, uh, they were not actually that all that difficult. Maybe maybe they were difficult, but they were not, you know. Uh, crazy I was a kid and so I would play them and then people go like wow that's 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 great you know because he can really play and then they would maybe give me some money so th that was that was cool uh, when you when you look at people who don't play music you know they can only take that much of virtuosity um, uh, because it's for them it's organized madness at one point you know because they they just hear a lot of notes but they, they don't it's just it's just too much you know so most people uh, unless you have educated people in music who listen constantly to a lot of fast music right um uh, and there again it's there's also a culture question for instance in france we had a lot of you know um uh, jazzers come in the in the 40s 50s um come and play really complicated bebop music in the 50s and very fast music very fast-paced music so the french audiences were actually used to listening to much faster music than we were in germany or switzerland it was more it was like march music and it, it wasn't about the virtuosity so but jazz would be played in switzerland or germany in that high speed of bebop everybody thought that was terrible music you know you couldn't because it was just a wad of notes if you don't get into it, you know? And it's the same with the banjo. That's why there was so much love-hate relation with the banjo when I was a kid with people. Because for some people, it's just a, a wad of notes, you know? Too many notes. And, um, and, and, and even Earl Scruggs, you know, said in his book once, you know, uh, that he was playing in his, uh, in his room. And his, his mother once came in and said... Hey, can't you can you, can't you just play something I could also enjoy when I have while I have to listen to you practice in the room? <laughs> and he realized, you know, that it's uh, it may be better if he goes. Okay. That being said, uh, still again, fast playing fast is a great feeling, especially when you. I think especially when you're younger. I I remember we had horses at home and I couldn't. I couldn't go fast enough with the horses or with the bike or uh, anything had to be fast. Everything had to be fast or it's just exciting. And I loved the banjo because there was so much, so much going on. So many fast notes. It was like speed metal. It was, it was something amazing. It got... Which other instrument would have something like that? That's, that's just crazy. Or... So... Uh, in order to play fast, it's sometimes easier to go to the bridge, a little bit closer to the bridge, and don't play too hard. Um, and you can play, let's say, uh, you can you can sound a lot more forceful, sorry, if you use th thinner strings. For instance, if you play nine gauges, nines, and you don't even have to play that hard, and you sound like you're really digging in. Um, uh, these are, these are uh, considerably harder strings, so I have to... Uh, to, to have that same sort of zoing effect on the string, I have to pull a lot harder. The other advantage I have with, with thicker strings is there's an advantage that I have a little bit more um, pull. I mean, I know a little bit more where the strings are. It, it helps me a little bit, but it's a matter of getting used to. Uh, the other thing is what keeps us from playing fast most of the time is how the index finger comes back. That's something that 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 we that we can actually realize. If you play a roll that goes uh, thumb, index, middle, index. If you go like this, when you when you're not warmed up, that index finger doesn't really want to come back. So my warm-up practice, you know, after holding on a steering wheel for a show or being in some, you know, uh, or, you know, yeah, anyway, in a situation where I didn't, couldn't play and I need to go on stage and play and get warmed up fast, I need to warm up my right hand because the right hand is really where the timing and the tone of the, of the banjo is. And so, so what I do is I hold the strings 
and I play this. Or I play a, a, a variant of it where I play middle index middle thumb. Once that works, a forward backward roll. That really comes back in time. In confidence. The other problem is the thumb. Um, uh, the middle finger is the least problem, actually, uh, for most people, I realized. It's the thumb, because the thumb has to travel the most of all fingers. It, it goes all the way down to the second string. And to have a really good feeling where the thumb is, is very important. Now, I told you before that I have a, a sort of a... Um, I, I love the blue chip uh, pick, but there's also a, a pro pick that has a similar idea, you know, with the metal band that works really, really well as a fantastic plastic they're using as well. The nice thing about these picks is they're quite stiff. I mean, they're very hard, so you can really rely on where they're going to be, where they're going to land. Um, sometimes I miss my plastic thumb pick, you know, the Golden Gates, because they are just, uh, I don't know, they're just a little bit more spoingy. But when I play really fast and hard, they don't seem to come back as, sometimes they're not so reliable. They, they sort of, you know, slip a little and then they go, and then I really don't know where I am uh, for the next hit. And and you so you, the, the mind constantly has to readjust. With this pick, I noticed uh, we once played in Branson. I first, you know, tried it. I could play really fast, clean, because it really helped me to understand to really uh, rely on where this where the pick's gonna hit. So if you take the regular Scrux standards, you know that you learn like. And you really try to play them as hard, as loud, and as fast as possible. And it's got to be really ugly and not nice. <laughs> That's it. So, so I, I know that people, you know, sometimes play banjo and they're at home, um, living with somebody in the same household, and then you always hesitate in playing that loud and playing that ugly, in a sense, right? It's. And there I, I want to I say again, it's like when a child runs, it doesn't look like an Olympic runner, you know, where it looks so smooth and everything's perfect. It's the, the, the child has to figure out and it's, you're going to go, oh, it's going to fall, it's going to fall. And this is the same thing it's going to happen to you when you play on the edge of fast. And you maybe could even, con, you know, compare it to any, to like a bodybuilding skill. You have to build up these muscles. And in order to build up these muscles, you look, uh, I'm going to show you this. Can you see this muscle here? This muscle, this is, uh, I'm not a very strong man, but this muscle is really, really strong because it, it, it holds my hand in place. And I have a good grip. I have, I have a lot of strength in my hands. I can always, I could say that because muscles is not only to hold muscles, only to move, it's also move to move fast. If you have good muscles, you can move actually quite fast. Now, you have to build up these muscles. And uh, I've seen videos of uh, Tommy Emmanuel, you know, doing um, uh, uh, exercises in the hotel room, just going with bar chords, you know, really quick in a pattern, you know. You know, like that, and really, on a guitar, it's harder to do because you have to press down so much harder. But then if you do that for 10 minutes, maybe five minutes, don't do it too much, just play ugly, loud too loud obnoxiously and play the mistakes play all the mistakes and if you don't want to listen to it i used to do it you know putting earplugs in if nobody's around or i would even open up a banjo and put a towel in it and and dampen it down so i could really play loud i think in order to actually be able to play really loud really fast and powerful i think you have to want to do that i think it's something that is not you you will get faster um, to a certain extent automatically because you're going to be as playing as fast as the people you're playing with for instance if you would play banjo with Ricky Skaggs you would have to play really fast because he plays enormous tempos you know with his band and so if you want to or with uh, let's say uh, Mark Bruett is a very good fast uh, Bruett is a very fast banjo player um, and uh, 
and and they need they need that train 45 really to be you know blistering 180 beats per minute or something like that um, and but when you play with people who I would play everything with well you're not gonna be playing much faster than that if you always play with the same people and so you have to do that for yourself by yourself and you can like I said there's two methods you can take the metronome do it with the metronome and then increase the speed slowly on the metronome which is a fine way of doing because you also learn where the roll is going the other way is a free fall where you just go as fast as you can and you drive yourself a little crazy doing that you know because then there's almost no limit and you really start to and then you go back to the metronome and do that you know so I think that's uh, uh, that's my take on playing um, uh, fast. Yeah, I, I wrote down here, you know, sometimes it, when I was a child, it felt like, you know, I didn't have a driver's license, but I felt like if I could play that fast, it, it must feel like you're driving through a little Italian town with a sports car <laughs> way too fast. <laughs> it's like a video game almost today, you know, you would, you would, you would say. And, uh, can I jump yes. in here real fast? Yes. Um, uh, with the right hand, uh, what would you say about the, the anchoring the fingers and keep and also trying to keep the hand relaxed when you start to speed up? Okay. Uh, well, that's that's hand position, and we can talk about that real quick. Um, I, I think if if I'm in a in a position with my hand that is relaxed to begin with, I can go in all, all directions better. Right? I, I, I don't, I'm not going to angle or do any weird things for speed because, uh, you know, I, I say J.D. Crow, for instance, he looked like this, but he would probably sleep like this as well, you know. Uh, but for me, this is not natural. I, my hand looks like this and everybody's hand looks different. But the main thing is that it's relaxed. When I started off playing banjo, I only had one finger on the head. And there's a lot of banjo players who only have one fingers, you know, like Lynn Morris. She would actually anchor the, I think, the pinky behind the bridge, you know, great banjo players. You won Winfield. And, and, but then, uh, and then there's people who actually have it right here, you know, like Alan Shelton would always play with one and the ring finger would sort of move freely along. And they could all play really fast. But I, you know, for me, the, at one point, the ring finger just came down. And also, I'm not too like this. I'm a little bit almost like this. I adjust my picks, you know, when you look at the picks when, where they are on my fingers, I just tilt them over a little bit. See that? And so they strike straight, even though my hand is not. Um, yes. Is that, does and that and if I'm playing fast, if I'm like, if I can play fast, but it gets very kind of uh, clumsy and and uh and not clean is yeah. is there anything to do to kind of help clean that up or am i just yes. learning how to play yeah. badly yes that's what i said before you know you can learn how to clean this up by really just trying to play clean or while you play clumsy but you cannot unclumsy it <laughs> by, while not playing clumsy does that make sense kind of <laughs> you know you cannot you know, a, a child will only learn how not to fall if it constantly falls, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden it will overcome these little things where he, he remembers, that's why I fell, or this is why I stumbled, or this is why it didn't work. The body learns to adapt to it because you push it there as well. But if you don't go there, for instance, you know, if, you, if you're not relaxed, if you're not relaxed, relax is a very important thing, being relaxed. But but if you don't want to, if you don't play fast a lot, you, you, it's going to be very hard for you to ever play really fast. You know, so, so we aren't if we aren't just learning how to play clumsily if we keep practicing. No, no, it will it will smooth out if you have the urgency to smooth it out, of course, mm -hmm. as well. You know, if you hear it's not it's not it's not it's not if you hear it's not you have to right. listen while you play. And if it's clumsy, well, try to figure out where is, where is it clumsy? And then, and then uh, maybe go back just a few notches, you know, where it's not so clumsy and then speed it up again, you know? But, and, and that sounds like a ridiculous, amazing process to get there, but it's not actually. It's, 
you don't have to play for hours fast every day. You just have to want it to play maybe five minutes on the edge. That's all. You don't have to do more than that. And very quickly, you will develop, develop the strength. And it's like driving fast, probably. It's a getting used to it. Mm hmm you know, it's a getting used to do, do, but driving is a lot more dangerous, you know. <laughs> 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 the banjo is not, it's not dangerous. But if you have a, if you have a run, uh, just some run anyway, uh, and, and then you just speed it up or you play it too fast. So now I had it right. You see, uh, twice I didn't because I don't play this run. But uh, so, but I, but I then then I had it. But then I learned. Okay, this was every time I hear, and so I start to even it out in that speed, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so if you have people that push you in the speed, you're definitely gonna get faster, right? And you can also then take a drum machine and let you let let that do that with you or. Um, play along with records you know when I was a kid I would constantly play along with the same f you know few records uh, um, uh, Earl Scruggs uh, you know the, the different ones you know just the, the usual suspects you know I would come home from school and take my banjo and then play along with that with the record and I would struggle greatly you know with a lot of pieces but then after a while all of a sudden it was it was good now the question now remains why would anybody want to do that anyway but I think it is good if you have a little few extra horsepowers in speed because then you can relax a little bit more in the speed that you actually want to perform in you know it's like when you when you when you have a piece and you can really actually uh, you could but you don't uh, it's like a car that has has a bigger motor but it could but you don't have to but it feels good it's more confident in the speed it's in does that make sense yeah, yeah. Instead, it's running full throttle, you know, because you just have a lot more control and you have a lot more time to think because everything runs like in a slow motion, you know, because you could play faster. You know how it feels to play a lot faster. So every th so a speed like this. <laughs> it wrong but because i was thinking but uh, but that speed just that speed seems slow afterwards it's like kind of like when you're on the interstate in germany and you drive with 150 miles per hour for two hours and then you come down to 75 you feel like you could walk out the car <laughs> it's so slow right and that's the same with with this so so i would encourage people to 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 just play as absolutely fast and hard and also as ugly as they can because in that ugliness they know what to fix they hear oh it's not nice let's fix this right and and don't go slowly about it go full go, go full about it you know a child will not run slower a child will run as fast as it can always you know and i think that's the fastest method of becoming a fast player uh, i think i started playing five string banjo and uh, and i think Two years later, I could play 180, 190 beats per minute, you know, easy. And I'm not exaggerating, you know, because I played with people who really wanted to play fast. My brother. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a crazy fiddler. <laughs> okay, I think, um, uh, I think that's good. Let's go to the next subject. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> or is there anything else? I mean... I, th I think that's good for this week, for this half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, I need a, I need, I need, a, I need a sip of coffee. <laughs> so we're going to talk about, um, in the second half, we're going to talk about embellishments, correct? Yes, embellishments, you know. Also there, the first question, why? <laughs> <laughs> I guess first first thing was, what is what are embellishments before we get uh, into it? They are just... Uh, uh, um, uh, embellishments uh, are um, um, uh, making things uh, more pretty, right? It's like in Baroque, you know, you make a little kringle on it, you know, you, you emphasize something, right, by adding something to it, right, or doing something with it. 
an embellishment. And um, and the music, uh, uh, in Baroque music, again, you know, I'm just going to reach back a little bit. You know, that was actually a style of highly decorated music, right? That's what, that was Baroque music was all about. You know, you take a very fairly simple idea and then you really uh, make it very uh, uh, beautiful by putting all these little kringles and things in it, right? Um, but when we look at bluegrass banjo, just go really straight to practicality here. Uh, an embellishment is actually nothing else than the slide we do here, for instance. You know, we can look at this as the embellishment of this note. So it's just, you had this note, and but we put an embellishment in. You know, make this note more important by give, doing something more to it, right? And, and if we looked at the first string, well, we can do this, or we can do this, or we can do this, right? So this in bluegrass, it's traditional to go with this, with this flat five here, and then we have here the slide, or, or, you know, all these. But this, but going from this note to this note, and then the third string, or here, right? This is the typical bluegrass. So down. It's actually nothing else than right. So, so these these regular slides and things that we do on the banjo are embellishments of of the thing. So, I showed that example, but I want to show it again. If I have Red River Valley, So let's just take that that little passage. Um, if we want to uh, emphasize the melody, um, uh, let's, put, let's let's just put it in a roll first. So we just put it in, we just filled up every note. But now the melody is starting to disappear, mm -hmm. right? Or um, and in order to bring the melody out, we want to do something with the melody. We want to embellish it. So instead of just playing, or we want to we want to give this note, this melody note, more importance. Now, how can we do this? Um, actually, the first thing that we could do is not to play more. We could actually play less. We give the note compared to the other notes more room. So let it ring twice as long, make it a quarter note instead of an eighth note. For instance, it would be like. So you can hear already this. I put I have a roll going on, but you can hear the melody better because after every melody note, I make a little pause. So that note actually has twice as much emphasis than the notes that would be just in a roll. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, but if I just want to keep everything going, no pauses, then I can, then I have to do something with the note. to actually um, uh, play the melody notes louder mm -hmm. the embellishments do it for me uh, I once uh, spoke to to Jim Eanes when he was uh, um, uh, he told me you know about barn dances they would play and there was no microphone and there was a lot of people and they would play and you would play on a banjo <clears throat> as loud as you possibly could all night long you know you would play really really loud and that's why they would also buy the loudest banjos that they could buy at the time. And then they would play all the notes as loud as they can. <laughs> right? And in order then to get the melody out, you know, you, you, you can give it a little bit of an extra kick, I believe, you know, by playing a little bit louder. But, uh, but then also you, you run a little bit of a, of a danger that the roll becomes a little uneven. You know, it doesn't quite flow as much anymore if you have 
loudness emphasis too much, you know, in it. Mm-hmm. Um, in a, if you want to sound it like, a, if you if you want to sound like a ball bearing on marble, right, where it sort of just sort of runs forward, and you can still hear the melody. Um, but then embellishments is the is the way to go. So of course you could use different embellishments, you know, for the same idea. If, for instance, if I go, you know, I could do this, or I just give this note a, a first different note. So it's a different embellishment idea. So if I have a, 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 mel- a, a thing that goes maybe... I, this, is a, this is a melody line, right? It's good to do, put the embellishment in the beginning of the line, because in the beginning of the line you get the attention, how oh, there's something happening that I could follow, right? So, so you could go... Or, which is a hammer pull-off. I could also, you know, put the same with the... But maybe it's, maybe it's not even necessary, because I already have the attention here. If I only do it, it's also good. But it doesn't invite you at first. It doesn't really invite you at first. Sounds a little more peaceful than uh, maybe I don't know. I have to figure that out. But if I've it's also pretty, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I can go. the melody it's all about getting the melody more uh, more audible in the context of the of more musicians than just the banjo you know that's one reason the other is you make the melody more pretty maybe you know by 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 adding it a little because singers uh, also don't just sing da 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 you know that always sounds static it's there's little things that they do all these wonderful little uh, uh you know, passing notes and little, but it's basically, um, you could, uh, for instance, have this note here and you have a little pull off, you know, in. It's usually in sheet music, it's a little note that's a very little tiny note that's up there, a little grace note that's sort of written. And you go, and it doesn't come before the bar, it actually comes exactly where the note is instead of just going, it's. embellishments now the other one would be like from or a hammer on the in and then go in with a half note like like this and now I can show you a little trick that you know that, that, that I use a lot of times on the banjos for, for this for this kind of embellishment um, I uh, for instance like here I take the thumb and I take a melody note or a, a scale note And what I do is I play, and I play it. I, I don't, I, I don't do hammer-ons. I actually play it with the right hand, and then I take the middle finger, thumb, and then I play with the middle finger, uh, and then and then I play with the index finger this note again. So it's just a backward roll, and then I go. 
We have the, the thumb here. my question so embellishments don't have to be just with the left hand you can do them with the right hand as well yes right yes right you know for instance uh, if i have um, um if i have then i would maybe you know if i, I do either this or play it or i can use two strings i i played the first note here and I do a backward roll like thumb on the second string and then on the first string here with the middle finger and then and then uh, and then the index finger on the second close to that to the, to the primary note are they always kind of a note that's on either side or do okay you never have, have a what is the, the upper note the upper note is always a scale note right mm -hmm. the upper note is always a scale note if I, like that right but if i go I always use a chromatic, just a note below, just, just, just not, not a scale note. I'm not going. I'm just going to sort of grab a half note behind. But the upper is a scale note, and then here I would. Right, mm -hmm. so I can. Uh, I can do this also on the second string, second and third, like that. But that's too complicated. <laughs> it's not what I actually want to. Are they are yeah. they always triplets, or do you sometimes use other? Um, like I said, this is not a triplet. This is just a grace note. Right. Right. Or right. The other one is a is a slide, you know, in a bend. If you want to, uh, uh, I think the one of the finest banjo players on the planet is Ron Block. You know, anyway, you know, he's got amazing skills of how to embellish things. He because he, he doesn't play, a, um, uh, let's say, a lot of complicated runs, but he takes the melody that is there and he makes it as pretty as can be. I mean, I'm always astounded by him how well he can make a melody. Um, and I said that before. Bill Monroe said, you know, a, a good solo is usually uh, the melody played in good timing. But I think also beyond the timing, there's good embellishment of the melody. You know, uh, um, uh, if you have, let's say, will the circle be unbroken? <laughs> maybe you know uh, maybe it does sound start to sound too baroque at one point but um but to 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 play the melody and try to work, do something with the melody ron block is i think somebody that you really need to listen to also the 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 the, the bends uh, are very important you know um to bend into a note um uh you, you can uh, just you know uh, uh, uh just start off with this one but slides are very important so even before you would start maybe putting a roll into something try to play maybe the melody um, uh, 
with just make the melody sound interesting uh, like a dobro maybe i think a great influence for me to listen to was jerry douglas because he played so because on a on a on a on a on a dobro you don't play you don't do that you stay with the melody um uh, you know and the way he was able to bring the melody out with almost effortless it seemed with little slides slurs coming in and you know that 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 draws the attention to this right uh, even and, and an embellishment is also uh if you have the note and you put a vibrato on it or you do something with it make it more interesting and, and i think that's the secret to a lot of great musicians is their their ability to um, play something that seems very accessible because you can follow the melody but the melody is extremely interesting uh, the way it's played so it's not hugely complicated not putting a lot of melody around it or a lot of extra notes a lot of things but the melody is played so um tasteful in a way it's not just you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's without just I'm just I just come up with something but um, and then if you then play that and put the roll in and there 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 is what I do a lot when I, I I like to do that on the second string because then I can put ease more easily a note that could the notes around with the two open strings here a double Sonny Osborne would do a lot of these yeah so he would uh, just that, that was um, what was it Con uh, country boys and what was it Georgia Mules and Country Boys, I think, was this one thing. <laughs> yeah. So he was a master on, on on making these chords sound as embellishments for the melody. You know, um, uh, very very important stuff. So I, I I'd rather when I play, look for what's the actual melody I want to hear and how do I go about and changing this melody like if I, if I had salt creek so I have see and, and it makes it pretty and uh, more interesting and i don't have to search a lot i know where i should look and making the melody a little bit more interesting by 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 uh, adding a, a thrill. Sometimes it takes a while for me to figure out exactly the positions um, in a piece. You know where I want where I want them and how I'm going to achieve them. And do I play uh, do I play them with hammer rolls and pull offs? And then uh, or do I want to play them with with the picks as a roll? You know. And there again. Uh, it eased my mind at one point when Doc Watson once said to me, uh, he said, you know, it takes me a long time to come up with a version that's that's worth playing for people. <laughs> I like, I still to this day, I think it's one of the nicest statement I've ever I heard anybody say, you know, it takes me a long time 
to come up with a version that's worth playing for people. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, you know, that's is worth playing for people. That I like that tremendously. I thought, yes, he puts a lot of effort in, and if he had a a nice solo for Shady Grove that he actually played in 1970, maybe I don't know, uh, and I would play it with him at Merlefest, he would still almost play the same solo. And I once said to him, you know, do you change the solos much? He said, no, I think that's a good solo. Why should I change it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> I can play another thing in the next tune. I think this is as good as I want to hear it. You know, these are the notes I like to hear. And so there's nothing wrong. You know, I just, uh, it would work in out a solo. It would work in out something that you think is, is pretty. Um, but just to complicate things or make them more... Uh, is one way of doing it. Uh, the danger of losing the people while you do that is also great, greater. Um, and maybe you don't care about that because you just need to do what you need to do. That's all good. But I'm saying it's sometimes nice just to take an old melody like um, uh, Old Spinning Wheel or uh, uh, Wildwood Flower or something like that and just then try to uh, just make that melody a little prettier I think that that that'll be that'll be good and these embellishments you know d- d- before you even put the roll in maybe just maybe just work on the embellishments a little bit you know and think about them so again you know uh, sliding sliding into a note bending down into a note it's like a pre-bend you bend first And, and of course, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, embellishments that you can hear by we talked about, you know, the subject clean. We haven't talked about that in particular now in, the, in, in these grace note kind of things. Um, there is a car outside my driveway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is rare. Um, so uh, uh, clean. Yes, there's music. What is clean? <laughs> there is because there's an effect on 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 helping a melody to come out. Now, there's in bluegrass we have a name for that. These are these are ghost notes. <laughs> you know, these are in the tablets the way you can see. And these are notes, but they're rhythmic. What I do is I, you know, um, uh, a lot of times I just use an effect of embellishment, a, a note, like a sound, just pulling the neck a little bit, or using a damping effect with, with this chorus effect at the same time. This is also a great effect of an embellishment. You pull the string and let it snap against the fingerboard. Yeah, I like that. But the basic... Um, Uh, I think it helps if you listen to some blues guitarists, you know, if you want to play this kind of, these kind of movements. Um, But, uh, but the effect is, you know, they're not, it's not everything clean. Uh, That's uh, that's a good example, maybe. Um, Eddie Adcock, I'm I'm sure you're familiar with Eddie Adcock or, you know, Don Reno. Don Reno didn't play. I mean, he played some really clean, great banjo. But a lot of times it was the effect, you know, he would go like and then he would go and he would like you would have you have, you have notes like that. And, and but this little you know that would add so much percussion and so much sound and I don't know if maybe sometimes he would do it intentionally. Like 
like that. And that's not pretty <laughs> in a way, but it has a rock and roll effect, you know, in a way. And that's what, what also uh, Eddie Adcock did when he played. <laughs> But it wasn't always that clean, but the effect was great, you know? So sometimes to anything to get a laugh is, you know, I like to play clean and there's music that needs to be clean. I like to play as clean as possible, but sometimes you have to sacrifice a few of the notes to make it sound better. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, 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 so there's clean, but there's also, uh, just a sort of an energy this is just a it's just a tool and, and it can have notes that sound a little rough or are not quite clean there's a lot of notes in in earl's playing um i mean not not a lot but there are all these notes that when you would really transcribe earl's music there's a lot of the a lot of the notes little notes that are like not quite there or uh they're almost there and, right. and but you hear them because your mind sort of calculates them. They're there, they're they're, they're these ghost notes. They're there. They shouldn't be there, but you hear them, and then you uh, you 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 write it down. You go like, wow, uh, right? There, there's a lot of and also his finger picks. You know, would sometimes be very scratchy when you listen to Earl Scruggs' his finger picks. Sometimes they'll go like, hot 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 hot. You know, it would be very scratchy finger picks, and they go. For instance, the, um, the f what was the album uh, with Doc Watson together? Strictly instrumental, right? Yeah. Right. So, and you could hear Earl Scruggs had probably a pretty, pretty new pair of finger picks that he used that day, uh, because when he stopped playing, it's like. <laughs> This is my banjo sounds so much smoother. His banjo was like, hut, 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 hut. but because you had this lot, this this constant sort of metallic clickling and raspling, the, there was just so much more hold onto the note, you know. There was so much. Now when we listen to it and at home, we would go like, wow, this sounds really terrible, you know. But it would help the notes to stick out. It's like in old ancient times when they had harps. Um, they would reconstruct some of the harps that they built you know, hundreds of years ago. And mm -hmm. what they did, they put little uh, feather keels, you know, where the strings are coming out in the harp, in the Northern English harps. And they would put little feathers in there and it would give a distorted sound. It would go, the, the note wouldn't just be like this. It would look like, right? And in the in the when everybody was talking and or you know or you would play the, the the harp somewhere in the corner and it would go like it was like a distortion it was like a a, a manual distortion. Right. Remember when we put when we would play take poker cards and put them in the in the spikes of our bicycle to make them sound like that motors. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing, you know, with, with finger picks that scratch. It, all these things, there could be an advantage because people could hear you better, you know, because there's a little scratch in the beginning. <laughs> of course, then when you want to play... I mean, maybe you don't want that. <laughs> you know, so there's a, there's a compromise. But when you listen to Earl's banjo, you could hear it a lot of times really well because he would have all kinds of clonks and clutters and all kinds of things going on. He would go, but you hear how smooth my finger picks sound? And then when you had Earl Scruggs, it would like, and that's also actually part of a, it's almost like a, a sound em embellishment, you know. Right. When you go to Nam show, people don't want just a clean guitar sound most of the time, they're looking for some effect. That draws attention to their to the sound, right? right. And uh, now, when you play banjo, you do that too. Um, 
like a Fender, when you play a, a Fender Telecaster, you know, or a, a electric guitar, you want the strings sometimes to rattle. You want them to touch the fingerboard when you play. There's an effect. You hear this? You see this? Huh? It's not quite clean here. Here. It's okay. I'm going to play it a little louder here. See, this is not really nice. Now, uh, when I was young, I, I would get disturbed by this. Like, oh, there's something wrong with the banjo. Let's raise the action and do all kinds of things with it. But when you then play... But, see, but there's something clanky going on, which actually helps the sound. Hear that? Yeah. It's almost like a little distortion. And then when I play with other people, you can just hear it much better. But nobody would think that the band was distorted. Right. Right? There, there's a good example of a Bella Fleck when he played Riding on the Midnight Train with Doc Watson. You know, he played, uh, the Sam Bush played there, and then he starts with our better banjo. <laughs> Something like that. And the action is so close that the strings constantly hit the banjo. Dong, clang, clung, clung, clung. <laughs> but when I was first heard that, I didn't realize it. But all of a sudden, I realized, wow, there's a lot of noise coming from that banjo. Because right. the strings were, but it added so much to the sound of it. So I'm not saying people should, you know, put the action down or anything. But I'm just saying this, there's a lot of factors that help the melody to come out and the banjo to actually pop out in the situation of playing you know right, right and you have to sort of not dismiss a lot of things you know like my brother sometimes comes and says oh your banjo sounds too slick or your banjo is too too nice <laughs> you know i like it to have a little bit of a personality you know for it right. does that make sense yeah, yeah. well these yeah, so, are and, pretty... and that's all part of the embellishments actually i think you know yeah that, that makes a lot of sense these were two great you know Two great, you know, topics that we covered here, but uh, that was a lot of insight to, uh, to kind of pop out that melody with using different embellishments, and, you know, and whether it be a, a node or a, a kind of a sound embellishment as well. Exactly, exactly right. Anything to get the melody out a little bit better to the people. Mm -hmm. It's like when you speak and you wouldn't have a microphone, you know, what would you do, you know? Uh, you have a you have you know in the band you have pretty much five sometimes five people talking at the same time i mean they're trying not to step on each other's toes but and they leave you room but you still have to be the one who's the speaker you still have the, uh, the one who actually says it and uh, it's like a singer who sort of would sing introvert you know and there's a whole band playing and he sings to, there's a well beaten path on. nobody can really hear him right because there's no intention of actually sharing mm -hmm. and the intention of sharing the melody content is 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 what embellishment is all about yeah yeah well, that's great um let's we're, we've come come across our hour so um i know i know i know and, uh, but, i was very talkative today but i wanted to share so. yeah that's great and let's <laughs> remind everybody that you know next week we'll be at the same time we'll be doing the q a session on the two topics we covered on playing absolutely I, I really I, I really appreciated all the questions that you send in and last time and I'm looking forward for next week and yeah for, for you know because uh, I'm sure there's questions about uh, uh, the two topics well thanks a lot Jens do you want to play a little thing play us out as we as we go nah, not much I mean I just noodle a little bit and you can just turn <laughs> it off go.